council meeting. Um, could I welcome Dean Vera Baird, the police and crime commissioner, who will address the meeting in a moment. And can I also welcome Diane Harold from our external audit as a uh, Do we have any apologies for absence? Well then, uh, Councillor Bolger, Davis, and Reynolds. Yes, Councillor Austin. Yes, Councillor Austin. Councillor Kelly Cox. Councillor Austin. Sorry, my green. Proof? Yes. Um, can members sign the relevant attendance sheets so that we know that we do that? Um, and do we have any declarations of interest? No declarations of interest? Oh, sorry. Uh, Councillor McMeegan? Yeah, um, uh, thanks Chair. Um, given the nature of the, the motions we're up in front of, I'd um, like to declare I'm a member of Labour Friends of Israel and the Jewish Labour um, Movement uh, Delegate to Mark Constance the Labour Party. Can you uh, fill the form in and pass it in at the end, thanks. Anyone else? Matthew? I'm also, a little bit on. I'm also um, a member of um, it's Israel Friends of Local Government, I believe the organisation is. That's very much. Could you also fill in the form, please? Anyone else? Can we try for three? No? Then we move on to the next section. <coughs> Can we agree the minutes of the last council meeting on the 26th of July of the two records? I now, um, can I now invite Councillor Carol Burles to introduce this item, the next item, in this form. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to welcome Dean Fiorbet, DBA QC, our Police and Crime Commissioner, to address the Council tonight. As we know, North Hindsight is a brief place to live, work and visit, and continues to be one of the safest metropolitan boroughs in the country. Following her re-election in 2016, uh, and with an increased majority, I am sure all of the council will be aware that Vera introduced a new police and crime plan following widespread consultation. <coughs> As chair of the SAFER North Tyneside Partnership, I was pleased that our priorities reflected what we were seeking to prioritise locally, reducing antisocial behaviour Cutting crime, putting victims first, tackling domestic and sexual abuse, and building community confidence. It is widely known, however, that Northumbria Police has been one of the hardest hit police forces in the country by government funding cuts. I also know from speaking to residents and members that we are extremely concerned about the effect that this is having on our communities. In particular, we know that alcohol and drugs misuse leads to crime and antisocial behaviour and that we need to work even harder in partnership to address this. Vera, once again, welcome to North Tyneside Council and I just would like to say I also welcome our representatives from the Sega North Tyneside Partnership. Thank you, Vera. Uh, Mr Chair and um, Madam Mayor and um, Councillor Burdis and Councillors, thank you very much for the invitation to attend tonight. I have brought with me Superintendent Andy Huddleston, who's going to come and sit here, if that's okay with you, uh, and support me and answer all the dodgy questions <laughs> that come from you. We were only asked to come, um, I think it was Tuesday, and I hope we've got all the answers that you Want. But if I have in the end to take some of your questions away and come back with answers, I'll make sure that I do it. And I think that the issues really are for you to raise and for us to try to deal with. So what I thought I would do 
um, being invited to address you at the outset is to just talk about the funding position because it is a key uh, and critical issue for Northumbria <coughs> Police. And I really want you to know the position that we're in uh, and uh, the situation we, we face. Am I uh, being well heard? Have I got the microphone in the right place and so on? That's a great start. So if I, if I may uh, make clear, Northumbria Police since 2010 have lost £137 million from their annual budget. So that's per year. Our current annual budget is £270 million. So as you can see, I have just got twice as much a year as I've lost. So we've lost really a third of our funding. We've lost over 900 police officers. We have lost about 1,200 police staff. And we have done a very great deal to try to deal with those cuts. And I'll set out one or two of the things that we've done uh, later. But it's important, I think, that you should appreciate that we have literally had the biggest cuts in the country. And there is absolutely no doubt about that. The National Audit Office has just done a report making that absolutely clear. That's because the cuts have been of a, a fixed percent across the country. So let's take, because it's hard to put them annually, let's take a notional figure of a 5% cut which the government wishes to take from its grant. As you all know, police funding is made up of two component parts, so it's a big pie, and uh, part of it is government grant, and part of it is the council tax. So our council tax in Northumbria is 15% of the income of the police. So look at your pie again, this is the council tax. So 85% of Northumbria police funding is the government grant. So if you take 5% of me, you're taking 5% of 85% of my funding. In Guildford, the government grant in Surrey is 40% and the council tax in an affluent place is 60%. So that when the same pie chart but now in Surrey is cut by 5%, it is cut by 5% of 40%, whereas mine's been cut by 5% of 85%. So you can see, and it is literally the case, that Northumbria has lost twice as much as Surrey. And we have lost the most. We have a set of papers here which Councillor Burles has seen uh, before, and so it's Councillor Lovena, who are both, I'm very pleased to say, on the police and crime panel that scrutinises me, which sets out uh, exactly that. And so, I have sustained those massive, massive cuts. The council tax, which is what the government wants us really to have resorted to try and up our budgets, is, is of, of little use to assist here. I've given you the basic reason why. If I am allowed to increase the council tax by 1%, it produces for me 0.375 of a million pounds across Northumbria. In Surrey, an increase of 1% produces 1.2 million pounds. So this is four times as much as uh, an increase of that kind from the council tax. And so consequently, even when the council tax is allowed to increase, and as you'll know, we haven't been allowed to increase it for quite a while, and now we can, I'm getting further behind um, and not catching up. We have managed the cuts that we've had to make by playing reserves into the budget. <coughs> So in 2010, before I was elected, we had £71 million in reserves in peace funding, and we now have £9.4 million in reserves. 
and we haven't finished the cuts yet that have already been <coughs> imposed. I'll come to what follows this year and next year soon. But in order to finish the cuts that have already been imposed, our reserves will be down to £8.1 million pounds in two years' time. Uh, the recommendation from SIPFA is that it's about 3% of turnover, and you can see at 8.8% of £270 million, um, it, is, it is very, very small. Our council tax yield is very small, not only uh, in the way that I've described, really for two reasons. One is because this is a poor area, certainly compared to Surrey, and because the measurement is always on a band D property, and we don't have a lot of band D properties. So in Sunderland, it is about 87% band A properties. That's the lowest level. You will have a high level of band A properties. But the measures are such that I, who live in South Gosforth, and uh, you know, you all know how much I earn because it's on the website and I can't keep it secret, I live in a band C. So that's how few band D properties there are in Northumbria. And so the council tax take is very, very small indeed. So we have lost that figure of 137 million, and that is how, and it is not getting any better. And the rumour about what happens next is that it will be a flat cash settlement <coughs> at best for the police. Now, a flat cash settlement, of course, <coughs> means a cut, because uh, there is a, a very much earned pay rise every year, two or three percent, that it's gone up, utilities are, are going up. This year, the payment from the government was flat cash. I was allowed to increase the council tax by up to £12 a year, and I used all of that. That gave me an extra 1.6%, but still added together, flat cash in that, we were £2 million shorter this year than we were last. So flat cash again will have a similar effect if I'm allowed to increase the council tax by £12. That's the only way uh, in, in which it will not be even more grave. So it is going down and down and down and down. And meanwhile, crime is going up. <coughs> crime is not going up as much as the police recording figures suggest. There is a new way of recording uh, figures which has been in force now for about four years and, and at different paces, police forces are catching up. But it is not the case that crime has gone up by 70 or 80 percent over the last five years. That is a recording issue. But crime is going up and crime is becoming more complicated. So we have now crimes we've never heard of, modern slavery and trafficking, online stalking things that simply didn't exist a short time ago. And we have, post the Savile scandal and the obvious ability of the criminal justice system to convict you know, important people like Rolf Harris of sexual abuse, we have a great increase in reporting in rape, sexual abuse, and child sexual exploitation, and so on. Now, when the, the government talks about crime going down, it usually talks in numbers, but there's a very big difference uh, between you know, pulling the wing mirror off a car and how the police have to deal with that, uh, uh, between that and somebody who has suffered sexual exploitation, who is not sure whether they can report it or not, who might go to help to get help from a crisis or for someone else might finally be persuaded that they can trust the police enough, but they will have to be nurtured and supported in the same way that the, the, the charity itself would do. And the complexities of investigating something like child sexual exploitation are such that that takes a good deal of manpower, a high level of skill, and so there are almost two jobs in one to find the culprit and to find the evidence and at the same time nurturing the person who is likely to be the key witness if they are a victim. So if you lose them, you may lose the entire prosecution. 
to who can compare and contrast that. We had an operation in Newcastle called Sanctuary, which a lot of you will have heard about. It concerned gang exploitation, in fact, of young women, not of children, in the West End of Newcastle. In the end, about 18 people were convicted and got very, very long sentences. But for three years, the whole neighborhood policing team was taken off every other duty and put in that community to sustain the community and inform it and hold on to it. Every hotel, every fast food outlet, every pub, every bar, every stop, every taxi driver who applied for trade in that part of the West End was visited at least once by the police to look for intelligence and to look for suspects. And the whole community was engaged in being asked, what have you seen? Tell us about it. 40 detectives were allocated to that job for two years. And that kind of investment to get convictions of, yeah, 18 people, it may be there were 50 crimes there, but consider how much that has cost compared to 50 uh, scraping cars or, or even burgling houses. And when police forces go into something like that, so we picked up on sanctuary because two different young women came into two different police stations and talked in similar terms about what they'd seen. And so the police picked that up. Many, unlike in Rotherham, the police were very, very quick onto it. So they followed up those lines of inquiry, but what they didn't know was that they were going to end up with 18, two years, a lot of very long sentences, and an enormous number of vulnerable victims. So from what looked like two small crimes, that's where it went to. And there is no predicting where any of these go. So with that level of not only <coughs> increasing crime now, but also increasing complexity, the downward pressure on funds, mostly people, is terribly important. 85% of the cost of policing is people. I mean, obviously, it is people. And we have done everything we can to not scrap people. We have had to close police stations and put officers in police <coughs> shops so they're nearer the public anyway, but to get rid of great big edifices. I just signed off Pontyland, which has been sold to Bellway uh, now for a uh, sum which will assist a little bit. We got rid of a whole tier of middle management by not having six area commands, cutting it down to three. We may have to think again about cutting it perhaps further. We don't really respond by sending an officer to quite a range of crimes now. We try and resolve it over the telephone because it is a better way of doing it and it saves resource. We've tried all of those things. I have set out my store to keep neighborhood policing and the chief constable is absolutely <coughs> with me on that. That's the most important aspect. That's what gives you confidence if they're on the front line, if you see them, if you know them that somebody is caring for your community. They get an enormous amount of intelligence, intelligence just by being out in the community. So it's not about you know nice folksy stuff. We've had two very large trafficking cases that came, the intelligence came from individuals who'd seen something they weren't sure about and spoke to a PCSO in one case and a police officer in another case because they get to know them and they know that they can say, look, there may be nothing in this, but I thought you ought to know number 10, there's something funny going on. So they are massively important in my view and we will keep neighborhood policing as long as we possibly can. But I hope you've got just from this brief sketch some sense of having lost nearly 900 police, over a thousand staff, and this complexity of crime having come and as having stuck to the idea of neighborhood policing, that there aren't a lot of places for us to go next. And so we will have to wait and see what the government next visits upon us. I hope that's a helpful rundown, and I think uh, now, best if you ask me the things that are bothering you, and I'll try to answer them if, if I can't hear them. <laughs> Mostly. Councillor Brian Burles. Thank you, Chair. I believe that
that the feeling of safety in the borough still remains strong. However, there is a growing concern about how we deal with antisocial behaviour. Can you tell me, how will the police continue to support residents against the backdrop of government cuts and reduced police numbers? Yeah, Tyneside, North Tyneside Council has in fact, and um, your elected mayor is very aware of this, has led the way in dealing with antisocial behaviour, in particular in developing a series of volunteers who themselves have suffered from antisocial behaviour. This originated in the housing department here. Um, they, you set up a group of volunteers, people who've been through antisocial behaviour, come out of the inside and were therefore very good to talk to people who were suffering from it and give them all the support that they needed to get through it themselves. So that was so impressive and it did come from housing, which is really interesting. It came from housing that we then funded your housing department to train the other five local authorities to set up a series of volunteers in each and now victim support regularly train refreshed volunteers to do that work all over Northumbria. The police will stay in the community in the way that I've described and they will respond to antisocial behaviour and they do have clear requirements on them. If somebody vulnerable is ringing about antisocial behaviour, they will be there within an hour. That is their target and they will try to keep it. And they will know when they get there if the individual has run before. So they'll have a sense of the vulnerability of the person and they'll have a sense of whether they are a repeat victim. Um, because, of course, we've now got this ghastly word, phablets, which is a sort of mix of a phone and a tablet, which they have, they have got those. So when you ring for something, the call centre will send <coughs> out information and they will set to and try to solve the problem. There is a big advent in Northumbria Police of problem-solving approaches to policing, which means don't let's just look at is there somebody we should arrest, is there somebody we should take to court, what is the problem here? Who are the kids who are doing it? Or you know, what is the issue? Simple stuff I've seen, but really effective. Somebody suffering from kids who sit every Friday with a few bottles of cider on you know, a wall behind a hedge not far from their house, <coughs> chuck stuff over, make a lot of noise, call names when, they, when you go out. And so the orthodox police response to that would be to go see the kids and arrest them. Do you know what they did? Actually, they got the council to cut the hedge down. And then they had nowhere to hide. And they were just completely, plainly visible. And so they went somewhere else. I can't promise you they're not bothering somebody else. But at that very simple example, the police now try to do what will stop the issue and not just follow a process leading to court. Now, I don't know how your antisocial behaviour levels are. The figures suggest that they're not great. But that is the approach that we're taking to it. And we guarantee you that if you're vulnerable or if you're a repeat, we'll try and get to you within an hour. Is there anything to add? Yeah, if we just add, in terms of um, Einstein's definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result, um, the same goes for antisocial behaviour. And in terms of any of you aware of the work we've done in the MetaWell, from my MetaWell, that is about increasing the community potency. And that is how we will start to change things and do things better through work we've been doing with the council, through the head teachers, and um, the promoting of the mini police and the cadet scheme. That is helping set young people's values and beliefs for the future. That is a way we will help to change things as opposed to continuing trying to get hold of kids and speak them and take them home. Um, and that is how we will change things going forward. In, in North Tyneside, I would say, within the force, it's a really good example of, um, of how we do it. Thank you, Chair. We are currently refreshing our community safety strategy, which is due to be considered by Council, not meeting in January. As part of that, we intend to strengthen the Safer North Tyneside partnership. Are there areas where you think our partnership needs to do more? I think that is a question that unless Andy's got a response, I'm going to have to take away and come back with 
I don't know your community safety partnership in great depth. Police officers attend, not me. Um, and uh, I, so I need to, to, uh, to consider that in a different way. I think that community safety partnerships have carried on despite enormous cuts as well, but sometimes are denuded of some of the resources that they need to be able to carry out their work. Well, Anne, did you go to the North Time Site on yourself? I don't personally know what one of my staff does, and in terms of the relationship, what I would say is that North Tyneside's community safety partnership is a very strong one, and if you look at some of the tangible results that we've had, um, particularly around even um, the, the threats to some of the schools through email attacks, and um, certainly there are going to be attacks on the schools because of the relationship there are between those partners, and we're very proud that not a single school closed in North Tyneside during that period, when if you look across the country, there were many, many other schools that closed because they didn't have that relationship when it came to those times of need. And if, in terms of where we'd like to go, my personal view would be is the 24-7 um, um, provision around crisis support for young people. And um, that personally would be one where I would like to see and support if the work that's been done, particularly by um, Mark and the Council around the provision of that. And it's difficult, but it's one that will have a significant impact. Councillor Drummond. Thank you, Chair. We are constantly encouraged to report crime so that the police can gather intelligence and respond appropriately. However, concerns have been raised to the police and crime park panel about the performance of the 101 telephone number. Can you advise what improvements have been made? Yeah, um, I sort of suspected that something of that, that kind might come up because 101 has been a real concern, particularly to the Peace and Crime panel, if I'm not mistaken, both Councillor Burners and Councillor Mogherini have raised that, so it wasn't my suspicion that it was something that was troubling you quite a lot. So I've got some figures which suggest a significant improvement. I'll be able to tell you one extra thing when I've, I've gone through these figures to show what um, I, is, is happening uh, as well. In 2017, the force had a 30% increase in the one demand compared to the previous year. Suddenly that happened, and we all worried enormously when he did that he might continue, and in fact, that's exactly what has happened. So there is still 30% more than there was just over a year ago. But what they've done now is introduce some technology which they hope will assist and this is an automated initial access selection point so 101 is answered and the callers select a number of options press one if it's a call for service that's an incident on a crime report a non-emergency kind of call press two you can see why i'm reading this kind of Press 2 if you know the extension you want. For custody inquiries, press 3. To speak to an operator, which is customer service generally, press 4. So that's helped. So calls for service and to speak to an operator may be one thing. If you know the extension you require, that tends to be police officers ringing in from outside who know the extension, or members of police staff ringing in from outside who need a different route, actually, from 101 to get through. And custody inquiries, that's largely about friends, family of people who've been brought into custody, or solicitors trying to make uh, an arrangement to go and see somebody in custody, or an appropriate adult who's coming to sit with the victim, the person in custody, uh, uh, if they're going to be interviewed. And those, again, are best redirecting directly to custody and shouldn't be holding back the queue for the one. So uh, it, it was hopeful and it seems to have done uh, okay that those two are now quickly diverted out <coughs> of any weight. So April to July 2017, Northumbria Police had a 101 average answer rate of 77%. That means there were 23% of calls that weren't being answered at all. Um, don't fear that that happens in 999. It doesn't. 
what happens in 999 is if they're not answered within a fixed time, they, they are deflected to Durham or to Cleveland, who then come back to us. And from Durham and Cleveland, the same occurs. So there's a fallback position there. But what they want is different. But still, 21%, 23% of people not getting any answer when they want some help from the police was not good. So now, July, it's 91%. In 2017, the maximum wait time for 101 was, are you ready? Two hours, 30 minutes. Compared to in 2018, where it's been reduced to an average of 45 minutes. So it's still not exactly brilliant, but still you know, a hell of an improvement uh, on that. Um, Non-emergency call performance has, has increased too, and we've, we've got non-emergency answer rate of 81%. Um, so what those figures about 45 minutes are about are about the whole thing. But if you get, once you get through, you get a much speedier response. So we've, they've invested in more staff and a whole new customer service model to help with the quality and quantity performance of initial contact for less urgent calls. And so we expect that if you ask me to come again next year, I'll be able to tell you an altogether better story. But we have shifted it quite a bit. I'm a Sir Optimist, you know, it's a sort of women's organisation, a bit like the Women's Institute, but we just, you know, we're a bit snootier. <laughs> um, and I get them that's really good because you know um, middle aged to elderly women which most of them are unlike myself we are kind of invisible and you can get them to do all kinds of test purchasing without anybody thinking that it's going on because nobody kind of suggests so we've done some one on one test purchasing the chief constable didn't know uh, about that until I told him when we were at Newcastle City Council, we have found quite a significant improvement from the first time we did it. It's just not a lot, I mean, it's just a few, but uh, a significant improvement in the time for answering. So remember those figures were maximum waiting times, but actually that is the way to judge it because you don't want anybody waiting that long. So hopefully uh, we have cracked the problem through a bit of technology and the influx of a new, a new kind of breed of core answerers who are not interested in just saying, okay, I'll put you through to extension 54. They're interested again in solving the problem. And that's that's <coughs> how I've found them. Andy, anyone? Uh, the only thing I'd add to we uh, we now get just short of one million calls a year. So it's, it's in the context of how we're trying to handle the trap lines. Councillor Sandra Thank you, Chair. Our metro system is a wonderful resource, but residents tell me they don't feel safe travelling on it sometimes. Um, I know a lot of work has gone on in North Tyneside with the street pastors and other people trying to make it safer, but just can you tell us about any other further work on the Nexus system, um, given the massive cuts in your budget as well, of course? Yes, uh, I, I can. Interestingly, I was talking today about the possibility of Nexus buying a vehicle for Northumbria Police um, to ferry around special constables. We are very keen that our special constables should, I mean I know it sounds as if I want them to go on anything other than the metro if they're looking for them, but that isn't the case. It's about getting, getting people uh, to the metro. We want our special constables to travel on the metro. We want our special constables to be around the area of metro stations where there's been quite a lot of antisocial behaviour. And Nexus are very engaged with us. It's a very good, strong partnership uh, with Nexus. And they think that that is a way of making sure that we've got sufficient flexibility. We would want to, and, and you know, you put your finger again on the cuts, that's why it's the specials who are really focusing on it. But it's an ideal job, I think, for specials, because what it requires is a presence, you know, a uniformed presence and a friendly approach. Of course, they have all of the powers of arrest of a full-time police officer, but they are usually, well, they're always in a different job as well, 
and if you can get them from the local area, that has, again, an extra effect and they may even be somebody you know very well who is there on the metro. So the idea is that we have specials on the metro itself. Nobody will ever know when they're going to be there. It's a bit like the ticket inspector. So we hope that that acts as a bit of a deterrent and that there is an increasing real presence there. And the vehicle is really about if there's antisocial behaviour around the station, we need to be able to get to where it's gone and tackle that. So we haven't accomplished that. We haven't been absolutely sure that the vehicle is what we want to do that, but we're definitely clear that the special is going to play a big part now in trying to make this the metro safe. I'm very aware that time's creeping on and I've, I've seen three hands up. So, after that, these three speakers, if you could make a question short <coughs> to the point. Thanks. Councillor Rankin. Thank you, Chair. Um, the size of the cuts and the use of reserves are really quite staggering. Um, and I'm glad you mentioned the National Order Office report because obviously they're independent, so it's remarkable what's happened on the cash basis and also in comparison to other areas. From the point of view of North Tyneside, is there a drill down from the, the 900 officers that we've lost so far, is there a drill down into how many have been lost across the North Tyneside area? <coughs> I, I don't know that it works exactly like that and I certainly can't give you a drill down. Um, I think that you know, police officers are flexible mm. so there's, there's definitely still basic cover, mm. absolutely everywhere. And then when there is a need for particular operations like an outbreak of serious antisocial behaviour, or a couple of times ago when I came to your open review and scrutinised that there had been an outbreak of um, damaged vehicles, mm. which turned out, to, I think, to be some children who were going up and down the same streets every night breaking, breaking vehicles. But there are, for instance, outbreaks of house burglary, which are usually because somebody's been released from prison, who they know very well, then they will move officers around to try to ensure that those uh, outbreaks are covered. So I, I don't think that it's practical to say exactly how many have been lost from here because of that. But Andy, may have. You know, I completely agree in terms of those exact posts as to what say. What I would say though is that where we have made those cuts is the likes of the middle management, which has taken up quite a few, going from six commands to three, but then also around the preservation of the frontline service, so the 24-7 response in the neighbourhoods, which is, is where we, if, if the last thing we do before we turn the lights off on the way out, is that is what is our brain for what we need to do. Yeah. So, but hopefully, we're trying to reduce any impacts we may be able to see on the frontline. Yeah, thank you. Councillor I'm sure most of the elected representatives in this chamber are very concerned to hear of the cuts to policing. Um, however, since 2010, I think most public services have um, experienced um, cuts to their budgets. Very high level in some cases, um, they experience in the policing. Um, have you seen any trends in the policing service um, where your officers are picking up um, the short form and attending call outs? that were previously, um, would have been picked by NHS or mental health issues um, or their colleagues and how you, have you any statistics on how that would be impacting and diverting the police colleagues away from that? Yeah, that, I mean, there is no, <coughs> there is no doubt that um, because of local authority cuts in particular, the police have become, instead of a last resort, to first resort for many things. So for instance, um, the sort of noisy party type antisocial behaviour would have been the local authority responsibility. Now they come to police and, um, and the police have to go out to local authorities. Now I can only afford to have that nine to five by and large. But the mental health question is such a good one and I'm very grateful for it because we have taken some really good steps with mental health. What I think the police officers find is that when, when they are out um, in, in the community, they sometimes come across people or people are reported to them are behaving oddly. And they, uh, acknowledging that there's likely to be a mental health issue, historically didn't have a lot of choice about what to do. So they might take that person uh, into, in fact, to arrest them, take them off 
to uh, somewhere from where there could be an assessment done, which is likely to be somewhere like St. Nick's. And the call centre would fetch out uh, consultants to assess the person, what they needed to have. That sometimes took a very, very long time, as you can imagine, because they would be at odd times of day. And sometimes, so officers, one or maybe two, had to sit with the individual, you know, who should have never been in police custody at all, whilst that uh, consultant was waited for. If that individual had had any drink or drugs, the consultant wouldn't do an assessment because you can't separate the two. And so you would have to take him away. And where are we going to put him until he can be assessed? Well, he can only go in a police cell, which is where he should never be at all. That's not how it's done now. Now, we have community psychiatric nurses on shift with the police. And when APC comes across an individual like that, they can call the psychiatric nurse who can come out if necessary, or be in the police station on the phone, can give advice, can, importantly, get access to the individual's health notes, which of course the police can't and never should be entitled to do, but a health professional can, may even know the individual, but will be able, by talking to the individual if necessary to, or whatever it takes, will be able to give the officer advice. So sometimes, the stories I've heard, I do a thing called talking to the front line every 12 months or so, which is just going out in the police federation, winding into a meeting of front line officers, and I just ask them how it is. So some stories I've heard, all the officers think it's great, some stories I've heard uh, are along the lines of the same people who used to come around again and again and again are now not appearing so much because there can be some better diagnosis done by a community psychiatric nurse and they can be directed. But sometimes it's simple as he's not taking, we've wrong his mum, he's not taking his drugs, get him home and he'll be fine. Alternatively, this is a really flawed case, get him sent links as quickly as we can. But we have had use of police cells in the last year in single figures for mental health people, whereas they were uh, in a lot of use before. So it's a brilliant, brilliant piece of work <coughs> which Northumbria Police had absolutely nothing to do with me. Northumbria Police initiated that themselves with the health sector. I think it's working really well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Last question from Councillor O'Shea. Thank you very much, Chair. Hopefully to finish this session on with a positive note, and a big thank you from the residents of Whitley Bay on two counts. Uh, first of all, a couple of years ago, there was the threatened uh, closure of the police office in Whitley Bay, but I'm pleased to say that, uh, that I think <coughs> your intervention, Dave Vera, that uh, brought about the, uh, the new office in the centre of Whitley Bay, which is highly visible and a valuable asset for the local residents in Whitley Bay. But secondly, and you mentioned in your address about community policing, I think we had an excellent example of good community policing in Whitby Bay, where we had a spate of uh, significant anti-social behaviour, and working together with local police, council officials, nexus officials, and local residents, we were able to significantly reduce that anti-social behaviour, which for me was a big, a big plus for for the local policing in Whitley Bay. So a big thank you from the, from the people of Whitley Bay for your work there. Well, that's, that's really very kind and very well received. <coughs> partnership working is really important, and I don't think there is better partnership working anywhere with the police than here in North Tyneside. It just has a history of meshing extremely well. And as to Whitley Bay Police Station, what we were able to achieve is we definitely, you know, these great big, like, civic edifices, which police stations were, you know, making some sort of declaration in Victorian times of the power and majesty of the civic setup and the police. These are massively out of date and they are also awful places to work. So what we were able to do was close that, sell it off, make um, a better funding out of that to help with police and, and put officers in a much nicer environment, much nearer the community. So they're right in the middle the shopping centre, they're clearly <coughs> able police, everybody knows where they are. So it's kind of making a virtue out of necessity and it's, uh, it's very pleasing to have you thank you. <coughs> Thanks a lot. <coughs>
As we seem to have moved on to comments, is there anyone else who's got any comments? Councillor Clark. Thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, I do apologise. I should declare an interest. My son-in-law is actually going to spend more money at Free Sports. I've just remembered that. It's just a general comment because um, I'm echoing the sentiments of other people um, in reflecting. I think the sadness about cuts to policing in general, I think it's a really sorry state of affairs that we're losing valuable um, services and officers um, in general across the whole country. But I think the key issue for me is that the impact of those cuts isn't equal, it isn't fair, and it isn't just. So thank you for outlining the nature of the funding there, but most importantly how it impacts differently in different areas. And I think a lot of the attention for us and priority is about closing the gap between um, people who experience disadvantage and those who don't. And I think this is yet another form of inequality and disadvantage and something we've got to take this government task on. So thank you very much. Yeah, but I completely agree because when you, if you count up, there's a chart showing us in the National Audit Report, which one of uh, your colleagues referred to, there's a, a chart showing exactly how, uh, who the cuts have impacted. And if you go up from us, the next is West Midlands, the next is Merseyside, and if you carry on in that way, with the odd exception, they are all heavy urban areas and they don't. Thank you, Chair. Must have clear interest, I know, viewer. <laughs> but uh, I, left, I left the service now, I don't call the force, but 2011, and it was an excellent force. We were the lead force in many aspects of the country. We knew the cuts were coming. I think they've been very uh, severe to us, and it's been totally out of proportion. We had an excellent force, and what's happened? We've had 900 officers and 1,200 police staff leave the positions. It's a disgrace. That's why I fought my election on 2012, that's on here. But it's, um, we must say, if you take this back to the staff and the officers, I'm in two stations most weeks because of the work I do, they do an excellent job in very different circumstances, and we really appreciate what they do for us, because they do keep it safe, because when something goes wrong, we all run that way, they run that way. So it's very important that our police are supported and our police staff. So take our thanks back and thank you. Well, thanks very much for that. I was just in the ward tonight just two nights ago, where some of the achievements and some of the acts of bravery that have been carried out, two officers, a, a woman and a man, who were called out to a domestic violence issue, which they thought would be you know, pretty standard, because I'm afraid there's a lot of this about. When they got there, found that a man had two dogs, who he set on them, first of all, and when they warded the dogs off, he had a machete, so the male officer tackled that, and the man, and then kind of, uh, she, she went out and went round the, the, the back of the house to try and get at the guy from the back. And when she came in, she saw that the man had a gun at her colleague's head. In fact, it wasn't a real gun in the end, but I don't suppose he knew that. And he tackled that individual, and they subdued that individual and brought them in. They didn't have guns, of course. They did have a truncheon and they had some gas, and that was what they were able to use. But you know, the incredible bravery of dealing with that, as you said, they didn't run away, they knew they had to stay. The, the lady who went round the house, the, the PC, I think it was she, or it may have been the man, they got the woman out of the house, threw her out the garden, so that she was in no danger, whatever happened. There are some amazing stories of what our officers do. And I'm incredibly proud, I've had a lot of roles in my life, barrister, MP, minister. I've never been prouder than since I've been a commissioner here. Northern Red Prince are excellent. Last comment from Councillor Burris, Harold Burris. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, my comment is to basically close and uh, thank you for coming along this evening and answering our questions. Having this presentation, but I think the key message is we continue to work in partnership Especially, especially under austerity and the continuous government cuts. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You can't stay if you want. <laughs> 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 you won't close into it.
now invite Councillor Pickard to move his motion, which is item six, I think. Five, sorry. I just moved on. Okay, thank you, Chair. The Council's equality and diversity policy is an executive responsibility of the Cabinet and it is within the human resources portfolio held by myself. That is why the Mayor has asked me to move this resolution on behalf of the Mayor and Cabinet. I regret that this issue has, has been politicised because it's not about politics, it's about respect, dignity, equality, diversity and human rights. And that is why the Mayor has asked for this to be done as a response to the concerns of our local residents and organisations so that we can continue to maintain our excellent relationships with all religious and ethnic groups in the borough. The Council's Equality and Diversity Policy is to ensure that North Tyneside is a place where people feel safe and no one experiences discrimination or disadvantage because of their characteristics, background or personal <coughs> circumstances. We will not tolerate discrimination, harassment or victimisation on any grounds. This includes all forms of hatred, including anti-Semitism, as defined by the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, the IHRA, definition and supporting guidance, but also as further examples such as racism, Islamophobia, homophobia and transphobia. The implementation of our policy is not just a council corporate issue, it is the responsibility of all employees, all elected members, and everyone who represents North Tyneside Council will deliver services on its behalf. So let me make it clear, we will respond to any allegations of discrimination, victimisation or harassment through our appropriate term processes including our resolution and finally our discipline procedures. And that applies to staff as well as elected members. Our present equality and diversity policy was approved by Cabinet in April 2017. That was following extensive internal and external consultation. It is subject to an annual equality review by the 30th of June every year in order to evidence our compliance with the 2010 Equalities Act. Oversight of the policy, its implementation and monitoring rests with the senior leadership team supported by our corporate equality group which has members from our service areas, trade unions and our strategic partners. We have been in the process of updating our policy since the last annual equality review in June and we would be reporting to Cabinet early next year any suggested amendments following further internal and external consultation. However, in view of the local concerns, the Mayor has asked for the inclusion of the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism and the supporting guidelines to be brought forward immediately and not to wait until the end of the full review of the policy. Chair, I hope the whole Council can give unanimous support to the Mayor's intention to include the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism and the supporting guidelines into our Equalities and Diversity Policy. I so move. And that's that I'd like to second the motion and I'd also like to speak in favour. As a member of North Tyneside's Holocaust Memorial Day Committee, I'd like to first thank the elected mayor for signing this motion. Your continued support for the committee and the local Jewish community, as well as her attendance at the Holocaust Memorial Day, is greatly appreciated. I'm pleased to support, to support this motion tonight. It is per perhaps easy to think of anti-Semitism in a historical context. Pogroms in the 19th century, the Battle of Cable Street in 1936, <coughs> and of course the Holocaust during the Second World War. But anti-Semitism is happening right now. It is growing at an alarming rate, not just in, in the UK, but across Europe. Intolerance for Jews as a religious and ethnic minority is increasing from across the political spectrum, including the far left. The world was indifferent to the rise of Nazism and anti-Semitism in the 1930s. We can't repeat the failures of the past. We must stand in solidarity with our Jewish communities with both words and actions. The nature of anti-Semitism, however, is changing. Ancient stereotypes would still prevail, but new anti-Semitism that developed in the late 18th and 20th century has increased the acceptance of anti-Semitism public life, largely because it's disguised as political discourse. While legitimate criticism of Zionism and the state of Israel must be protected, 
Too often, the word Zionist is a proxy for Jew. Too often, criticism of the, of the Israeli government is used as an opportunity to attack all Jews. Too often, events in the Middle East are used to justify hatred and violence against British Jews. That is why this definition is needed. This motion tonight helps to recognize and challenge anti-Semitism, both old and new, no matter where we find it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And I now invite members to speak on the motion. So, Chair, I'd like to propose an amendment to the motion, please. Uh, well, then, have you got copies? Yes. Of that, of that member of the Labour will attend because of a health reason, 
and uh, it's hard to uh, participate by our uh, technology, but not was not allowed to vote. So there's a precedent in this chamber in terms of how you handle that. According to the legal information I've had, and I've been asked to vote, they are asking for agreement. Individual agreement. I'd hope that we wouldn't end up in a political tit for tat and MS resolution. That's why I deliberately moved it in a non political way. Let's look at the implications of this, right? I've already told you that the equalities and diversity policy is not just a corporate policy, it's the, the policy of all individual elected members, of all officers and all staff of the council. Any member who does not support that policy would leave themselves open for resolution or discipline process, whether it be a member of staff or through the standards <coughs> committee, if it is a councillor. So you're asking somebody to indicate whether they're going to get themselves up from the discipline. That's why I'm saying this motion itself is badly thought out, trying to jump on a bandwagon instead of discussion. The issue which is concerned to the people is, are we going to amend our policy? And that's what I have moved, and that's what I'm going to stick to. I've been advised that the motion is correct, right? So therefore, the amendment, sorry, is correct. So therefore, I'm going to allow the mover of the motion to speak, and then you can go to the board on it. It shouldn't take long. in the Council's Equality and Diversity Policy, and we completely agree that a totally unified position on this most distressing and concerning of issues is absolutely essential. However, some councillors are absent tonight, and so even a unanimous vote of this meeting will not be evidence of a universal acceptance by all elected members that anti-Semitism will not be tolerated by North Tyneside Council. <coughs> Why is this important? Social media recently threw an unexpected spotlight onto the varying attitudes to this issue within North Tyneside Labour Party. A newly elected councillor revealed that this issue has already been debated within the Labour group, who voted not to endorse the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism at that time. A description of events at that meeting in a series of tweets from a former member of the Labour group suggested a party split on this issue divided by their different attitudes, and most certainly not portraying anything like a unified position. <coughs> Members of our Jewish community should and will expect nothing short of 100% support in the fight against anti-Semitism. Our amendment gives the Mayor a valuable opportunity to offer the Jewish community the reassurance they want and deserve that every single elected member of our council rejects anti-Semitism and wholeheartedly supports the content of her motion. In addition, it also gives those elected members who are not able to be present tonight the opportunity to stand in solidarity with the rest of the council and with the Jewish community and accept the IHRA definition. <coughs> I hope all members will agree that this is vital and will support our amendment and I'd like to ask for a named vote. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chairman. Like my colleague, I support the sentiments of the, the motion, but I do think it is really important on this very worrying issue of anti-Semitism that all councillors <coughs> are asked for their support. We are all aware, I think, in the UK, across the generations, of the difficulties which the Jews have, su have suffered uh, in Europe in the last century, notably in Germany, the criticism, but elsewhere too, of Austria, Estonia and so forth. Criticism which turns to abuse, which turns to confiscation of assets, which has turned to imprisonment, and unfortunately in many cases to death. A lot of that came from the leadership in Germany. As I say, most generations in this country are aware of it, but it hasn't really been a topic of regular conversation until recently. 
in our country. And I suspect, Chairman, that, that is because most of us never felt that there was a real prospect of anti-Semitism rearing its ugly head in our country, a country which has been noted for its tolerance, for freedom, for democracy, for the rule of law. Now, however, it is being talked about. It's being reported in all our major papers and is a regular topic on the news. The change has come about since the change in leadership of the Labour Party. There is a leader now who appears to attract those who are anti-Semitic and who associates with those who are, but with those who indeed seek extermination of the Jewish race. This is a very, very worrying situation. We've seen only this week MPs needing physical protection because of anti-Semitism. It's therefore, I believe, very appropriate that this motion should come to Council and that we should all have the opportunity to make our position clear, and that includes those elected members who are unavoidably not present tonight, and therefore I support the amendment. Thank you.
That's why I will be supporting this amendment. Councilman Well, uh, please, uh, current vision there. Councilman but the fact is, we are promoting uh, the policy here tonight. What you're trying to do is um, ask councillors who aren't present to form a view. When they haven't heard the debate, when they haven't heard the contributions. But the question I've got for you is, what happens if they, they don't respond within the 14 days? What kind of uh, proposal have you got to deal with that? Is it a, a question of you using that clearly for publicity outside of this chamber? Well, well, you say no, but it's not in the it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not in the amendment of what you would like to happen to those that do not um, respond to the request. But I, I just think you've got to open your eyes and say that the majority of members are here in the chamber, and we make the policy on these matters, and as Councillor Pickard has explained, He's expecting everyone to adhere to it. And I think that's what we all do when we write on that form when you're elected, that you agree to abide by the council policies. Councillor Ryan. Thank you, Chair. Um, obviously, I welcome the full um, adoption of the IHR definition. And I know Councillor Brockbank's words there. At the same time, have you made any representations to your own party because they have not adopted the definition within the Code of Conduct at this time in full? You're asking me a question. I'm asking you a question. Have you made the same representations you're trying to make in this chamber? Uh, it's it's not a question. I can see where you're coming from, but it's not a question. Because you seem to be very strongly about it to do with more times, like not to do with your own organisation. Councillor Newman. Thank you, Chair. Um, <coughs> I want to keep this kind of quick because um, I remember when I served in Afghanistan, I served beside Jewish people, I served beside Muslim people, next to atheists, Buddhists, and I despair because we've spent the past 10 minutes on a procedural point about a technicality about whether or not a letter is going to be read. And what we really need to be saying is, we need North Tyneside Council support this definition. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's it. It's as simple as that. And I despair that we ended up in a 10 minute crossfire political exercise. At, at this point, because of the, the debate, and there seems to be an even balance on the numbers of people who actually <coughs> spoke. I'm going to move to uh, Councillor Pickard for his regular reply. Thank you, Chair. Well, I, I hope that the Council would uh, defeat this amendment, and I'll tell you why. I had hoped that we could not have a political bounce across the Council being clear that one or the other. However, it's an absolute disgrace that this amendment has not been used to further the cause of anti discrimination, but has been used to make uh, points of political nature in the most grotesque way. People have turned around and said it's a point of principle and morality. Well, principle and morality is not telling me what to do and you ignoring it for yourself. It's about saying it's a principle and a morality for everyone. Your own party, your own people at the top, ex foreign secretaries with Islamic phobia comments in the press. Your own people in your own party complain that nothing's been done about Islamic phobia. Your own party, just the other week, supported one of the most vicious, right-wing, anti-democratic, anti-Zionist, anti-Semitic country as Hungary in the European Parliament. All of your MPs voted in favour with them. Your own party hasn't well, in fact, it may, it may have by now, at the time you were complaining originally, hadn't even adopted and accepted the definition itself. And even now, it says it's accepted the definition, but it doesn't accept the working examples that have gone with it. That is the position you're in. It's a hypocritical position to be in. Let's get to the main motion, which is about discrimination, and let's get that progress, and let's get rid of this tit-for-tat political issue 
which is a disgrace that you actually raise it. Ask the council not to support this amendment. Now we'll move to the vote, and it's in the end vote. Councillor Island. Sorry, what was that? It's in the end vote. Well, I'm against the amendment. Is that what we're voting on? Yeah. <laughs> Straightforward and 
honourable. And so under, but not so, under the Labour Party's new leadership. Chairman, I support the motion. I wish the Mayor had exercised her executive powers several months ago. Do I see your hand up, Councillor Paul? Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Uh, on this side, do you find it quite rich that um, the, La the Labour group talk about commitment to anti discrimination and anti-Semitism, seeing the <coughs> national mess their, their, their movement are in on this particular issue? It's encouraging them in North Time in time North Time to see the Labour Party finally embracing the inevitability of accepting the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism as well as the associated guidance. In the same case, I'm actually concerned with part of the motion. I think he's bringing in what he wants to bring in. It doesn't actually come in the motion, but you know, in the debate like this, you're actually allowed to and I have no doubt this going to be some more fun in the end in the very near future. Thank you, Chair. I won't call them fun games, you'll follow serious matters than those, but thank you. We on this side certainly support the motion entirely and would suggest that it is long overdue. Whilst not wishing to focus too heavily on the national disgrace which has marked the Labour Party's debate on this issue, I cannot let this moment pass without highlighting the need for wholehearted acceptance of this definition. Why is it so important? Why is the issue of anti-Semitism so important here? Since the Balfour Declaration in 1917, when British Minister Land of Palestine became a protectorate of the British state, there have been discussions and disagreements about who should inhabit that land that we now know as Israel. Whilst many wish to blame British imperialism, this demonstrates a tenuous and rather tedious grasp on historical reality. Point of fact, it was the League of Nations who invited the British state to form a protectorate, and later on the United Nations took on the mantle and agreeing the partition of the land of, of Israel. So it is not a purely British issue. <coughs> the reason I touch on the history of Israel is that it provides an important backdrop to the current socialist identity crisis we're faced with today. The persecution of the Jewish people throughout history, from ancient times to Stalinist purges after the horrors of Hitler's journey were revealed, compels to recognize the Jewish people as having been uniquely targeted throughout history and time. Uniquely targeted. I think that's an important point here. It was, and I am proud to say this, conservative Prime Minister in Balfour who began the creation of the State of Israel with its previously mentioned declaration. Yet those on the left ignore these facts to imply Israel is an inherently unfair, and some have said, unfortunately, racist endeavor. This is wholly unacceptable, and smacks of anti-Semitism parading as freedom of speech. This form, form of discrimination and hatred has its roots predating the current socialist confusion in the labor movement. Anti-Jewish sentiment has been the hallmark of dictatorship, oppression, and tyranny from the time of the ancients to the ongoing acceptance of anti-Semitic feeling in the Middle East and sadly much, much closer at home. It's a national moral scandal that we've had to wait until recently for Corbyn's Labour to adopt the IHRA in full, and even then he attempted to introduce caveats into that definition to claim that Israel is a racist state. This outrageous proposal was by right-thinking people in the Labour movement vote down. Turning from the national and historical issues, I'd very like, very like to briefly touch on the local issue in this borough. It's worth pointing out that the Conservative, government, left. The conservative government, unlike previously uh, said, has accepted this definition in 2016, as well as the Conservative Party. But locally, one lo local Labour councillor, who shall remain nameless on social media, publicly challenged the newly independent councillor for time out on a debate in the Labour group meeting where the Labour group refused to support the acceptance of the IHRA definition some months ago. This is a spectacular demonstration. This is a spectacular demonstration of the cynicism of the, of the Labour Party in Britain's motion today. 
and I would invite the mayor, if I am wrong, to correct me on the spot that we didn't take place and my vote did not take place. Finally, whilst we support this motion in full, it's vital we have named vote, and it's a huge disappointment in the Conservative group, and a shame on the Labour group that, we, that, there is, that, has, been a perfect, that, that there has not been an uh, attempt to, to write to all members on this motion. Next, Councillor Stern. <coughs> I'll be very brief, but it's just I'm just finding it very difficult. <coughs> they won't stop They won't use the word pathetic. The only thing pathetic is to find members who are they bringing national politics into this. This is a local issue. This is something that North Tennessee Council have brought in. We've brought in. You've only put an amendment to it, so you didn't think of bringing it in. So basically, why don't you stick with the people? Who actually put in these seats and, and, go, and, and go on local issues and stop trying to support a government who is even is failed and have to put ten billion pounds in an old land is the government. So basically, you know, you're, you're supporting a government who is failed, but you're always bringing national issues. And really, the people who don't think say is you better than, than that. They really, they really should stop nodding, man. <laughs> 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 Unless you can stick to the motion that he's doing better than bringing national issues into this council chamber all the time. We've got enough local issues without going down all these national issues that needs to be bringing in. Can I have the next speaker, please? Uh, Councillor Irwin. And, uh, um, like the Deputy Mayor, I, I hope that we could get through this debate without political point scoring, but uh, since it's very clear that the opposition want to engage in that, I think it's very easy for them to try and swing mud. As the Deputy Mayor has already alluded to, the Tories were the only government, part, government party in Western Europe to vote en masse in support of Victor Orban's far right government. Could you move your mic closer, Councillor? A lot of people can't hear you. The Tories were the only government, government concert, uh, party in Western Europe to vote en masse in support of Victor Orban's far right government in the, in the, East, in the European Parliament. Conservatives whipped their 19 MEPs to oppose the action against Hungary, with just one member to find voting for the motion. The European Parliament voted by a two thirds majority to start up the Article 7 process against Hungary, which has been accused of violating press freedoms, undermining judicial independence, and waging an anti Semitic campaign against a leading Jewish businessman. As well as undermining civil rights, the judiciary and attacking Jewish businessman George Soros. Mr. Orban's government is subject to allegations of corruption, to the alleged spending of EU funds by his friends and family. Mr. Orban himself has described refugees as Muslim invaders and has been accused of being deeply Islamophobic. And furthermore, in April, a Tory council candidate in Cambridge was suspended for anti Semitic and homophobic remarks. In June, a Tory councillor was suspended for alleged making Islamophobic reports about the Mayor of London. I think the point here is that all large political parties have extremists on the fringe elements who unfortunately will harbour views that are contrary to the main beliefs of that party, racist views, extremist views. And it's our job as politicians from whichever party we belong to, to challenge and root out such behaviour when we see it, whether in our own party or in society in general. Otherwise, the stock of politicians and political parties in the UK is likely to continue to fall. And I'm afraid that so far tonight, any, any uh, member of the public listening to this debate and the action taken by the opposition would say that it's, it's raised the stock of us as politicians in North Tyneside to a new low. Yeah. Councillor Nigel Luskoff. Thank you, Chair. I'd just like to agree with the last two speakers, to be perfectly honest. I think we've brought it down to a new low. I didn't think we would get much uh, lower than some of the things that we were doing this year, but t tonight it is just an absolute disgrace. Um, I'd love to be able to change the minds of certain people, uh, whichever party they're in or wherever they are. Unfortunately, we can't do that. What we can do is make a statement and go forward for the people of North Tyneside. And I think tonight, <coughs> unless this debate moves on quickly and quickly turns, I think it's an absolute disgrace the way, the way it's going tonight. Yes. 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 Thank you, Chairman. At the 
start, I'd like to say that our amendment was not designed to be part of political in any way. It referred, <laughs> excuse me, it referred to all councillors, all councillors who were unavoidably absent, and that includes one of my own colleagues in the Conservative Party. We felt strongly that all, of, all the political persuasions ought to have the opportunity to make clear their support for this motion. I certainly support it, although I feel it does not go far enough. And like my colleague, Councillor Hudson, wish that steps had been taken sooner by the executive. Many people across the borough are very concerned about the rise of anti-Semitism in our country. And in particular, this has been caused by the conduct of the leader of the opposition in Parliament, Mr Corbyn. It's the concerns of the Jewish community which have been voiced about this in particular. I didn't think they we were being political with uh, our move, so I mean, now you're, you're blaming the leader of the Labour Party, so... Well, Chairman, that is where the concerns of the Jewish community have come from. They have seen that the leader of the opposition... It's, it's not no time to think this is a local issue. Yeah. Indeed it is. I know you can raise issues outside of the locality, but this is, this is about a policy which affects this council. Yeah, but we have had one of your members, one of the members on the other side, referring to um, supporting support from the Northern Irish MPs. That had absolutely nothing to do with anti-Semitism whatsoever. I am talking about anti-Semitism. We have a Jewish community in this borough who are concerned about the rise of anti-Semitism and their worries are being occasioned by what is happening by the leader of the Majesty's opposition in this country. The association with Hamas, for example, people he describes as brothers, who actually actively are institutionally campaigning for the eradication of the, of the state of Israel and the Jewish people. Uh, a, a man who has written for the Iranian newspaper, who's a, a country which is committed again to the eradication of the Jewish people, who takes paid work for that, continues to do so even when it lost its Ofcom license for broadcasting a torture victim's confession. It's that sort of conduct that, that people are, are judging and being very fearful. And surveys tell us that four out of 10 of Jews in the Jewish community are actively considering leaving our country. It's horrific that 80 years after the Holocaust, we are faced with that situation in our country. That is why, this, that is why it's so concerning. Earlier this year, the three leading Jewish newspapers in this country took the I think first ever step of issuing a joint editorial, voicing their concerns about what they describe as existential risks of anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. Just this week, we have seen a Labour MP needing security for physical protection at a conference. I can't recall ever that happening to a backbench MP, and in vain we have waited for condemnation from the leader of that party. That is why it is so worrying. And left. I fully support this motion, Chair. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councillor Rankin. Thank you, Chair. Um, this IHRA definition has been um, very public now for months and months, I would say 12 months, give or take. Um, at no point in time has any party brought it to this chamber until tonight, when both parties have effectively brought it forward, which I welcome because I would think it would go through unanimously. Um, irrespective of how it's going to be presented on leaflets, though, because it should be a political issue. Um, this is a Labour motion presented by no time to Labour Party to fully adopt the IHRA definition. And I think we should just go to vote on that, Chair. Must I turn away? Um, I'd just like to point out, despite what Councillor Brockbank has said about the conflict between socialism in Israel and Zionism, Israel has a, has a rich history of socialism, in fact, from its foundation in 1948 to 1977. All governing parties in Israel were socialists, they were all Labour Zionists. So this idea that there's a, there's a great conflict between socialism and Zionism is, is just inaccurate. Like every ideology, there's extremists, but they don't represent the majority. Chair, Chair I did propose going to vote, so can I get a second? Councillor Harrison. <laughs> Might I make it straighter? Chair, I actually came here tonight to actually vote on a motion that our Mayor brought to us. She brought to this chamber to allow us as councillors to show solidarity. You know, a solidarity 
uh, to the Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. And I think that's really important. We are giving that opportunity this evening by the Mayor to show that solidarity. Because after all, it is an executive decision that's been adopted, was adopted. So bringing it here gives us that opportunity to show that alliance to the people out, to show that solidarity to the people out there. And like others in here, I'm really quite appalled that we've entered into such a debate, a debate which I think we should all be sorry about and regretful, because I don't think the people out there want to hear us in our tit for tat across the chamber. I think they want to hear us stand up and show our alliance to something that we all think is important, and something that is so important that it will allow the coexistence of this world and we need those things at the present moment to sit in bitter and butter of who did it first or who's doing it last. The reality is the Mayor's given us an opportunity to show that alliance and I think we need to move to that vote now and put our hands up in favour of that opportunity. Councillor Pickard, right to reply. Thank, thank you, Chair. As I said earlier, I'd hoped that we could have uh, debated this motion in a way of how do we help our local residents to move forward and who are looking for support. And unfortunately, it's been hijacked part way through. Um, people can see the cynical politic games that were being played, and I, I recognise that uh, Councillor Nigel Hushcroft, I support what he said, that it was a disgrace what happened. It would take Councillor Hodgson once again the wrong end of the debate. He says it's about uh, adopting the, the definition. It's not just about that. The big debate naturally was about the supporting guidelines. And perhaps if he told Councillor Brockbank sitting next to it, he understood that and actually raised that in the debate. So perhaps you need a bit more discussion before you bring the resolutions forward. Councillor Wallace once again going into the historical background, trying to blame everything on, on the actual Labour Party. Yet I still haven't had an answer back about what the Conservative policy is. I can only go on a report because I don't have a copy of the Conservative rule book. Perhaps you can provide me one in 14 days of this meeting so we can actually see what it says. Because as far as I'm aware, it has been altered, but it now says, uh, as far as age, religion or belief, which should be interpreted as fully adopting the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism, comma, pregnancy and maternity status. It makes no mention no mention, as far as we can see, of the very point that you made was the politically important point of the supporting guidelines. So, you know, over the next 14 days, prove us wrong, give us a copy of your rule book with the whole definition and supporting guidelines actually in it. As far as uh, raising the debate nationally, uh, all I can say is it was mentioned, I mentioned it, and then colleague uh, Peter Early mentioned it, but perhaps let's get this straight. This, in the report on the 13th of September, so very, very recently, a leading British Jewish organisation has condemned Conservative MEPs after they voted in defence of the country's far-right government. The Board of Deputies of British Jews said it's very concerning that the Conservatives have chosen to defend Hungary's appalling track record, which they pointed out included vivid anti-Semitism. So let's talk about principle and morality it's just as good for your side as it should be for our side. People will see you being hypocrites when you do that type of thing in your own party and expect higher standards from the other party. When I started off the debate, I tried to say that it wasn't about politics. It was How about... Minute left, Councillor. So as I started the debate, I actually said that it wasn't about politics, about respect, about dignity. It was about our opposition to racism and our opposition to anti-Semitism. It came about because local people were concerned about the national debate, the debate which you continue to stir up yourselves, and asked the council, their local council, what can you do to give me confidence and support? That is why this resolution came forward. That is why I moved it in that way. Trying to hijack it and take national politics was against the best wishes of the people here. I hope we can all uh, agree to the resolution and I also would ask that it be a name vote. I would also say to the Chair, on the outcome of that vote, I wish to move a procedural motion. We will now move to the vote and it will be named for. Councillor Allen? For. Councillor Austin? For. Councillor Gary Bell? For. Councillor Linda Bell? For. Councillor Brady? For. Councillor 
rock band? Four. Councillor Brian Burdis? Four. Councillor Carol Burdis? Four. Councillor Cassidy? Four. Councillor Clark? Four. Councillor Debbie Cox? Four. Councillor Stephen Cox? Four. Councillor Craven? Four. Councillor Eddie Dark? Four. Councillor Linda Dark? Four. Councillor Day? Four. Councillor Drummond? Four. Councillor Ernie? Four. Councillor Glendon? Four. Councillor Graham? Four. Councillor Green? Four. Councillor Hall? Four. Councillor Harrison? Four. Councillor Hodson? Four. Councillor Janet Hunter? Four. Councillor John Hunter? Four. Councillor Huscroft? Four. Councillor Johnson? Four. Councillor Kerwin? Four. Councillor Lee? Four. Councillor Frank Lott? Four. Councillor Wendy Lott? Four. Councillor Gary Madden? Four. Councillor Maureen Madden? Four. Councillor McIntyre? Councillor McKeegan? Four. Councillor McMullen? Four. Councillor Mull? Four. Councillor Mulvenner? Four. Councillor Newman? Four. Councillor Oliver? Four. Councillor O'Shea? Four. Councillor Percy? Four. Councillor Phillips? Four. Councillor Pickard? Four. Councillor Rankin? Four. The elected mayor? Four. Councillor Samuel? Four. Councillor Spillard? Four. Councillor Sterling? Four. Councillor Thurloway? Four. Councillor Wagon Fairley? Four. Councillor Walker?
just an absolutely appalling abuse of power. It should be a shame of this I'm just concerned that the second mo motion of the night doesn't include the guidelines, and for me that's a really important part of the definition. You've got the definition in the, in the guidelines, and the guidelines are really important to understanding how anti-Semitism is manifested. Councillor, I feel like I think we're moving on to their motion, and what we're actually doing is in a procedural motion to Councillor Lord, did you want to speak? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, speaking to the procedural motion, as the move has stated, the uh, recommendations have already been covered. The motion has been agreed. Every member, sat, in fact, every member in this community, in this council tonight, voted in favour. And when asked why are we, are we moving this procedural motion, one could argue it's simply in, in the interest of efficient governance, but I would also argue that we've reached an agreement, should we not perhaps, to avoid further unedifying spectacles being made here, move to that procedural motion and move on to the next business. We have reached an agreement on one of the most important motions we could consider. Let's move on on a positive note. <coughs> Councillor Pickard, would you like to exercise your right to reply? Thank you. The reason I moved the procedural motion is I didn't want to see the unedifying uh, re repetition of the debate we've just had. Let's see what was actually just said in, in, in opposition to it. The, their motion goes further. Well, it doesn't. Most of the motion is rhetoric. It's actually the issues at the bottom where the instructions are contained that we actually have a look at. And let's look at what? It would be proactive on discipline. So we're going to go out people and say, we're going to discipline you in case you do something wrong. How can you be proactive on discipline? You have to be reactive on discipline. And once, I'm sorry possible. I didn't interrupt by the at all, but let me get it straight. I made it clear. It's not up to the council to be proactive. It's up to all members of staff. It's up to all elected members. It's up to all the people that we use our partnership. It's up to all the people that we use in the supply chain. It is not the count. You can't get rid of your personal responsibility by handing over to corporate to say the council should do this. And part of the debate we've had tonight has been the fact that it's a, you've tried to politicise a debate that our residents wanted to do. I do not believe that there's anything to be gained by going through that debate again because there's nothing in the recommendations as opposed to the rhetoric in the debate that hasn't already been agreed unanimously tonight. Let's move on, that the policy's there, we will give support to the Jewish communities around, around North Tyneside, and we have adopted it, and I give you the assurance about if people go against the code. And it's not just discipline for staff, it's standards committee for members as well. We've got that assurance, it is now council policy, all council members, whether they're here or whether they're not, will be expected to abide by that council policy on equality and diversity. And perhaps you should also look to how you're going to support as well. Because I'm disappointed about the numbers of members who have not yet completed their training. And I think if you're going to start throwing stones, start looking in your own area first before you start doing that. I will move that procedural motion be accepted by the council. Can I name please, Chair? Name please. And we'll now move to the vote. Chairman. Move to the vote, Chairman. We've got a vote. Name the vote. For the procedure on motion. Councillor Allen. Councillor Austin. Councillor Gary Bell. Councillor Lee Bell. Councillor Brady. Councillor Brockbank. Councillor Brian Burdis.
Lee. Councillor Frank Laws. Councillor Wendy Laws. Councillor Gary Madden. Councillor Maureen Madden. Councillor McIntyre. Councillor McMeekin. Councillor McMullen. Councillor Mull. Councillor Mulvenna. Councillor Newman. Councillor Oliver. Councillor Shea. Councillor Percy. Councillor Phillips. Councillor Pickard. Councillor Rankin. The elected Mayor. Councillor Samuel. Councillor Spillard. Councillor Sterling. Councillor Thurloway. Councillor Wagget Fairley. Councillor Walker. Councillor Wallace. Councillor Wheatman. Next item is agreed on a basis of 50 to 5. Such denial of democracy, Chairman, does not merit our further attendance at the debate. 50 to 5. Thank you. Councillor Pickard. 
Um, and thank you. It's interesting to see that when we talk about the finance of the council, that the Conservatives choose to disappear. <laughs> Could it be that they're, they're quite prepared to have a political debate about anti Semitism, but not to represent the rest of the residents of the borough as well through their support for the council? Or could it be that the one high risk identified by the auditor was one that was the responsibility of a privatised company that they privatised it to, to Canada? That was the one high risk that we did it. Or the fact that the irresponsibility of budgets that we were going to remind them about tonight, and perhaps that's why they've gone, was that a leading council said at the last budget, although providing a balanced budget for one year, the Conservative Amendment did not provide robust estimates or adequate reserves for the longer term. And so much so that the professional view of the Section 15 officer was that the Conservative proposed budget presented an additional significant risk to the authority's financial position. And this brought into question the financial stability of the authority. It's good to see that this council rejected that type of uh, short termism as far as finances are concerned. It's good to see the audit report confirms that people run a tight ship and that Ray, as the cabinet member, and Janice as the head of finance, keep an eye on all the expenditure in the council. We're always grateful for areas where we can improve that are highlighted by the auditor, and we'll always take full account of what they actually say and move it forward. I think it's overwhelmingly a very good report on the state of the finances within North Bankside Council. Councillor Spillon. Thank you, Chair. Um, I welcome this report and the endorsement of the work of this council in the last few years under a Labour administration in May. I think it's testament to all the staff who've worked so hard to make it happen. Um, or as already mentioned, the finance staff, but in every department across, um, across the council, um, including in those really difficult areas of adult social care and children's services. Um, it, is, it is very gratifying that the auditors have seen fit to come back with um, a very clear and ringing endorsement of our work and the policies. Um, and I'd like to thank the staff, as I'm sure everyone else here would do, for the work they do to ensure this happens every year. Thank you. Councillor Clinton. Thank you, Chair. This is the final report for the ZARS. Um, I've worked with this for my two to three terms, then we have uh, as a comment of our finance. Um, it, it may Everybody's been really excellent at the job you've done. Now, I'd like to thank Ms. Ord on behalf of the Council for the work over the last few years. And I just wish you a good work and with you. And I wish you all well for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Clinton. We now go to the vote. All those in favour, please show. <laughs> 49 0, I think it's just approved. Could I now call on Councillor Carol Burdis to introduce the next item 7 on animal welfare? Thank you, Chair. The Animal Welfare um, Regulation of 2018 come into force on 1st of October 2018. The regulations consolidate and place a number of pieces of legislation that govern the licensing of animals. This includes seven animals as pets, born cats or dogs, horse riding and the breeding of dogs. The new regulations introduce a wide range of welcomed improvements. In particular, they will ensure all licensed dog breeders show puppies alongside their mother before the sale takes place and all adverts for pets will need to include, include the licence number and the name of the local authority that issued the licence. This report at section 1.2 seeks to authorise the Head of Environment, Housing and Pleasure to exercise all powers and duties under the new regulations and to determine the level of fees to be charged. It is recommended Council approve option 1 contained within section 1.6 of this report which will allow the authority to act appropriately under the new regulations and be able to take the necessary action to safeguard the welfare of animals in the borough. 
Thank you. I understand Councillor Samuels is seconding this. Indeed, now we're certainly looking forward to the Conservatives' proposals on an animal welfare, but as we're going to have to miss this, um, I just said, just said a couple of points. Basically, this motion introduces compliance with regulations which uh, should regulate uh, the way that animals are treated across the borough, which is obviously well welcome. It tidies up, in a sense, the rules that exist at the moment, which uh, tend to be kind of all over the place, that brings them into some kind of semblance of order in, in, in line with and up of all, a lot of the kind of views that have been expressed. It does quite a lot in terms of animal welfare. Uh, the only final point was obviously, I think, I think the, the important point there is that um, there is, a, there is a, a part of the motion about fees being charged quite clearly. Um, it's important that this be as far as possible, be given the financial pressures on the council, um, self-funding, but that's probably a debate that's still to be had about the level of fees, etc. And I won't intrude on what's probably not necessarily my pitch at this moment. Uh, I second. Move to the board, Chair. <laughs> Anyone got any uh, questions? No comments? No, then we will move to the vote. All those in favour, please show. It's unanimous. <laughs> could we write to, could we write to them asking them for their support? <laughs> I'm already very stressed, so please don't take it any further. Uh, it's it's um, now move the comments to you. Uh, chair's announcements. I'm going to be very brief. Um, as you, as you all know, you've had an email about local democracy week, and um, we, we are making a plea to members to actually turn up to the Youth Council. I think for all, those of us who have actually been here over the years to the Youth Council, I think we've all went wow at the end of it, because to be perfectly frank, some of our members could learn a lot from the debating skills that come out of the Youth Council. So, if you can make it, if you've got the space, please come along because it is a very interesting meeting. It lasts around about an hour and it's, this year is its fifth annual general meeting and it's went from strength to strength. So, could you please consider turning back? Yes, Councillor Green. Chair, there's a member's development meeting at exactly the same time for all members. Uh, I've actually expressed an interest in going, but obviously I forgot to go to the member's development department with the two things. I shall personally ask them to change it. Thank you. I yeah, don't know whether I've got the power to do that. Then. <laughs> I'll have to read the constitution. <laughs> right? So, <laughs> so can I move on to Mayor's announcements? Thank you, Chair. Before I go to my announcement, I just want to say how pleased I am that this has been recorded so the residents of North Townside can see how important some of these uh, items we're discussing are to the Tories, to be quite honest. They should be here actually giving their voice and opinions on what's been discussed. Having said that, I just want to say now I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all those members who supported me on Friday when they came along the charity dinner on the North Town side, at Cairo Centre. Um, I want as well to thank to those people who donated prizes for a raffle. And would you believe one Tory donated a prize? How about that? How about that? But he wasn't here tonight. Um, also, I want to, also to those who attended the evening, I'm sure you will agree that this event was fantastic. It was a fantastic way to showcase the hard work that has been carried out on the Spanish city and our local businesses and other colleagues were there and they raised quite a lot of money. The raffle raised, I think, about over eight hundred pounds and when I get the final total, I will really report it to you. I know that many people didn't believe that the dome of the Spanish city would ever become a reality and by some of the comments I've had over the years, that is true. They used to say to me, what's going on behind those uh, boards? I don't think anything's happening. Well, it did. Um, I have received so many positive comments and feedback from not only those who attended the evening, 
but also from many other people who visit the Spanish city since the official opening to the public on Saturday the 21st of July. Thank you for your support for a very, very worthwhile cause. Much appreciated. Councillor Finn. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to just express my thanks to the elected mayor and to everybody that um, input into the organisation of the event at the Dome. As chair of the um, North Tyneside Carer Centre, um, we're very grateful for all the donations and for the, the money you've received. But thank you once again. It was a splendid evening. Thank you. And now we move on to council questions, which will be slightly shorter than what we first expected. Um, question one, Councillor Hudson, would you like to voice this opinion or would you like to take it as read? Take it as read. Who's, who's going to answer this? I am. Point of order, Chair. Uh, oh, yes. It's not the same order as what's on the paper that's before us. No, I think there was a print there, wasn't there? Oh, well, it's on my cue, as now you've got Okay, no worries. It's on Johnny. The question is, question one. Is the mayor able yet to state publicly that that North Town Council is absolutely opposed to anti Semitism? Have you got it? Apologies, I misread. Okay. Thank you very much. Right. Yes, of course, our current equality and diversity policy already clearly states that North Tyneside Council will not, under any circumstances, tolerate discrimination. And I hope Councillor Wallace takes Councillor Hudson to task for what he said in his email to me. As I already raised under the first motion on tonight's agenda, the policy review that I have requested aims to further strengthen the statement by asking Cabinet to amend the policy to include the IHRA definition and supporting guidelines. That's really important, those supporting guidelines. Furthermore, in order to present the unified position that has a council, we do not tolerate anti-Semitism, anti and I've asked council to endorse this action by cabinet. <coughs> Can we now move on to question two, which again is from Councillor Hodgson. Uh, take it as read. Well, it says on my piece of paper. Chair, yeah, try to say the words of print there, and the yeah. first two were down on Council Wards, in fact, were Council Wards. Yes. So, okay, if you could just check before we see which question is that the papers you've got at the top, you let us know who it was. It's Councillor Hodgson on here. Councillor Hall. I'm not sure where I, whether it is. Um, whether I need to give some sort of indication, but then in that question is an indication about uh, proposed energy from waste plant close to Nissan factory. My son in law is involved in some of that work, just in case I have to. I, I, I think it's best to uh, fill in the form and then at least you've covered your back. Yeah. Right. I think you're actually answering the question because I've got me totally confused. Certainly, yeah. I have, have, have too big value of that. Uh, and, and in doing so, I'm reminded of the words of the Chief Inspector. When you've all finished, I'll continue. <laughs> in doing so, I remind you of the words of the Chief Inspector earlier, which I thought were quite appropriate when he said Einstein's statement that uh, if you keep trying the same thing time and time again, hope you get a different answer. And in this case, this is the third time this issue's been raised. And I can only assume either he misunderstood the answers twice or that perhaps we need to look at the plan and train that it may not be good enough for people. Because as I, as we're all aware, the full council delegates its responsibility for considering planning permissions requests to the planning committee. The mayor has no part in the process of either granting or refusing planning permission. I am not a member of the planning committee.
plan committee either, but both myself and the mayor are opposed to this plan. I support residents in trying to oppose this being developed in North Fankside. I even attended the planning committee to speak against the development. I was disappointed that it was not rejected, but as a councillor I have to uphold the legal process. You should be well aware that the right to appeal is granted to the applicant and not to the people who are opposing the planning committee. Therefore, we cannot change that particular issue. You'll also know that they can't even start the development work without an environmental license. And I've checked our planning officers, and when they last checked, the developers had not applied to the environmental agency for a license. If and when they do apply, that will be the time when we can indicate our opposition. I can't see any reason why we should remind the developers that they need to do this. In fact, let's just wait until they do and then move it forward. In relation to the proposed plant in Washington, I believe that's the one they talk about next to the Nissan factory, my understanding is it is still going through the planning process and we've had no involvement in that process. It's a Sunderland Council planning process and if I looked on the website today, it looks as if the whole planning process is stalled that it's reached the point where, because the decision has been made, they've taken it back to have a look. But however, no wonder Councillor Hodgson's asking the Mayor to look into it because the protests that have written to the Prime Minister asking her to stop the plan. Now obviously we know that the problem she's got, he obviously has no confidence that the Prime Minister will stop it, so I'm sure the Mayor of thinks is much more powerful to try to stop issues than the present Prime Minister. So I, I, I think to Councillor Hodgson, third time lucky, the answer is still the same, it's got planning permission, there's nothing we can do about it. Now we'll move on to question three. Thank you, Chair. Well, so I'm happy to explain the detail. I want to begin by saying how grateful I was that the comments of the opposite team worked together so hard in very difficult financial circumstances to make sure our general fund finished this year in the plan. This is despite the presidented government cuts and unfunded cost pressures that we exceeded the government's proposals on the increased council tax. Specifically, at the end of 2017-18 financial year, the general fund was in service by £722,000. On the 28th of May 2018, the Cabinet agreed that the service balance would be used as follows. £200,000 transferred to the general fund balance, which increased the balances at the 31st of March 2018, to £6,804 million. 522,000 transfer the strategic reserve, which increased the balances at 31st of March to £14,473,000. General reserves have no restriction on their use and can be used to smooth the impact on significant pressures across the years, offset the budget required in the year, and mitigate the risks of unexpected events or emergencies. Since 2003 2004, the authority has held a strategic reserve in its balance sheet. This has been used to manage significant financial pressures which can arise in year or between years. For example, to manage the significant pressures arising from equal pay settlements and the cost of non statutory redundancy payments. The service balance has not specifically been allocated to individual services, but has been applied in line with the Council's reserves and balances policy and at the face of Fears of continuing cuts and unfunded cost pressures, particularly in social care, and this critical authority maintains some financial resilience. Thank you. Thank you. Can we now move on to question four from Councillor Austin? Just before we start, can I say that I find this question very concerning, and I'm going to actually read it out on her behalf. Right? Can the Mayor explain the work of the Holocaust Memorial Day Committee, what it does, when it last met, and how it works informs the development of the Council policy? I find that very, very disturbing. Who, who's going to answer that? Well, the Holocaust Memorial Committee consists of volunteers who are mostly, but not exclusively, from the Jewish community, will you believe? A representative from the show races in the red card and two councillors. Councillor Muriel Green has chaired this and Councillor Matthew Thurloway is supported by two council officers. 
The committee last met on the 17th of September 2018. Which isn't so long ago, is it? The committee's purpose is to promote equality, tolerance, and understanding, challenge racism and prejudice, raise awareness of the Holocaust, all genocide, and all forms of discrimination, including anti Semitism, racism, and homophobia. While it works further, the aims of both. The Holocaust Memorial Day Trust, a charity that seeks to raise awareness of the impact of all genocides in the 20th century, including the Holocaust, and our eco equality and diversity policy. The volunteers' focus is on prepare, preparing for the North Tyneside annual Holocaust Memorial Day event, not on the development of council policy. I have to say I'm extremely disappointed to hear that Councillor Austin did not know about the work of the Holocaust Memorial Day Committee. When for seven of the last 17 years since they've been there, there has been a North Tyneside elected mayor involved in her own political party. I don't know why the last uh, Tory mayor didn't put any on, anybody on this committee. Uh, I wonder if Councillor Austin know that we have a memorial garden just next to our building, here in Quadrant. And when I was cabinet member for children and young people, John Harrison, when he was mayor, kindly found the finance to make that happen. And that garden was completed in 2009, would you believe, in readiness for the comm 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 commemoration of Anne Frank's 80th birthday. The garden of remembrance, which is fully accessible, provides a memorial to the victims of the Holocaust and other genocides. It is only the second one in the country, here in North Tyneside. The former councillor David Chong chaired the committee, so you know how long this committee has been going, before handing over the reins to Councillor Muriel Green. And I have to tell you, since Muriel, has Muriel Green has taken on this job, she's done an amazing job in advancing this work. <coughs> Attendance at the Holocaust Memorial Day events are now recorded. But there is a, is a large audience each year who come together to com commemorate those who have lost their lives. I, I, although I've got an area from Councillor Hartson to say that you've never seen me there, so I sometimes wonder what Councillor Hartson is thinking. I, I, it's difficult. Because I have personally attended all but one, all but one of the Holocaust Memorial events. In fact, I hosted two of them. Uh, and I only missed last year because I was ill. So if Councillor uh, Hudson is at this meeting, what is he actually seeing and hearing? Hopefully the majority of council members will be aware of how much hard work and commitment that goes into pre preparation of the Holocaust Memorial Day. We have presentations from children and young people who are supported by their school, council staff and members of the committee. Each year, even more schools take part in special events. The, the ideas around the annual theme come entirely from the children and people and to the contrib contributions of their faiths present and, of course, our guest speakers. The schools decide how to use the material given by the National Holocaust Memorial Day Committee. Children learn about and are also encouraged to think about all issues related to Holocaust and genocide, which occurred in Cambodia, Rwanda, Bosnia and Darfur. There have been some powerful messages sent out by these themes. How Councillor Hartson never heard about them, I do not know. Membership of the committee has changed over the years, but has one original now Jewish member who is now in his 90s, bless him. And he did turn up on September the 17th, according to Councillor Green. I remember when I was a member of this committee, Henry Moss was a very, very valuable member of this committee. And unfortunately, Henry died a year past November, I think it was, and I actually attended his funeral, funeral because he'd given so much support in helping Holocaust be moved forward in the North side. There has always been a common aim and understanding and very sound working relationship, relationship amongst all members to work with schools in North Tyneside to educate our young people about the negative impact that intolerance and hatred and discrimination has upon society. Upon society. The Holocaust Memorial Day 
commemorations in North Townside have always been considered to be the best in the Northeast. And this comes from the, this comes from the Jewish community, community who actually come to our days. In addition to our children and people, our Holocaust Memorial Day gives local residents the, the opportunity to pause and reflect on a very dark chapter in world history and to think about the countless lives that were lost in the Holocaust and other genocides around the world. Our young people from many, many schools visit the concentration camps and come back and tell about their experiences and to talk to our other children in the borough. Hopefully residents couldn't appear to have noticed that we have lit the lighthouse purple or second June purple to launch the week. Most of our opposition people live at the coast. Did they not say that? Everybody else knows, noticed it. I think we must never forget these terrible events or the lessons in the Holocaust. And I, for one, as a member of this council, am very proud that we are able to unite people each year and that we are able to pause and remember the victims of these dreadful atrocities. Not only from the Holocaust, but in the years since, and sadly continues in some parts of the world. And Councillor Brockband stated he had been in touch with the uh, Jewish community for seven months. I've been in touch with the Jewish community for the last 10 or 12 years. Thank you. Question five to the Mayor from Councillor Judith Wallace. She asked, can the Mayor do the local Jewish community and all residents and that all instances of anti Semitism should <coughs> subject to the council's disciplinary procedures? Yes, I can. Our equality and diversity policy makes clear that we will not tolerate discrimination, harassment, and victimization on any grounds. Our disciplinary procedures require all leaders to maintain a culture that is free from bullying, discrimination, and harassment, where everyone is treated with respect and dignity. With regard to the elected members, the Code of Conduct states that we must not do anything that will cause you to breach any quality. For example, you must not make sexist or racist remarks, treat others with respect, not bully on anyone, not conduct, conduct yourself in a manner that could reasonably be regarded as bringing this authority or your office as a member of the authority into disrepute. I am therefore confident that any instance of anti Semitism will be subject to our robust disciplinary procedures. And I am convinced, convinced that the executive of this Labour group would not tolerate that either. Yeah. I think we're on to question six now. And this is a question from Councillor Matthew Thurl. Take it as red chat. Thank you. Councillor Johnson. And as fact, sure, it's great to see a member state and ask his own question, Council. We have listened to residents of concerns and in response, we have recently introduced a new seven day a week environmental enforcement service. The service consists of additional environmental warnings, will operate early in the morning until late in the evening. The purpose of the team is to catch any perpetrators committing environmental offences, as well as work with communities and schools to educate and advise. The team will complement the good work already delivered by the environmental wardens, but we thought it important to strengthen our presence during the evening and weekends. They will be making full use of the enforcement powers available, which include the issue of community protection notices, fixed penalty notices, eviction orders, and injunctions where appropriate. A new vehicle, the CCTV, will assist the team in collecting hard evidence that can support prosecution where appropriate. I'm sure every member of the chair will agree that North Times is a great place to live, work, and visit. I'm confident the additional environmental services team will help and ensure it stays that way. Thank you. Um, the next question, question seven, is from. Oh, sorry. Forgot, 
I took a part of this drive up to the White House event. And I'm pleased to say that the Mayor has asked that this be made an annual event. It was good to see how many improvements have been made along the whole route and the genuine responses from participants and passing out to the public, praising the fact that the regeneration has given people back a sense of pride in their area. Can the Mayor outline how she intends to build on this success and continue the process of regeneration for not only the coast but all areas of the world? Thank you, um, Councillor Cox. I'm very pleased to answer this question. And the 324 other, other people took part in that walk. I was delighted to be able to bring this fantastic event back in long time time. And it happened the last time in 2011 because the opposition didn't want it to go ahead. I'm very, very pleased that so many people took part of all ages. It has showcased the wonderful work we've been able to do on our coastline, and I've had many comments from the public commenting on how they feel once more to be proud to live in North Tyneside. And it was really, really a funny event happened, actually, to be quite honest, because Councillor Burgess and myself actually started to lead this walk, but we were last in. <laughs> But the, the laughing part was the one that lasted because I was keep getting stopped along the walk by people saying, thank you very much for what you've done, it's fantastic what you've done, we're so proud to be here. And even one woman said to me, uh, Can my, my, my husband loves you, I said, I don't know yours. <laughs> um, but it was really enjoyable walk, to be quite honest, it was so positive. And when we got to the end, I could see the relief on my members' faces who were there because they thought I'd died on the long way <laughs> However, there is always, always more to do. That is why I've asked for a new regeneration strategy to be reduced and brought before cabinet very, very soon. And this document will explain how we intend to help shape North Tyneside and make it choice fit for the future. It will look forward to taking each portion of the borough and thinking about its needs. What do we do for the population of North End? What do we do for the business in Killingworth? Do they long bend and forest tall? and how we should try and shape North Shields and how we can build on the success of the coast. I look, I look forward to bringing this forward next month and start working on the next chapter of our wonderful North Tyne side story. Can we move on to question yet? Oh, sorry. Supplemental question. Um, no, thank you. See, I'm so busy wanting to get ahead. Um, question to the Mayor from Councillor Andy Newman. Are there tables, Richard? Thank you, Councillor Newman. Um, as the Council is aware, the Government are still negotiating with the European Union on what Brexit, I'm determined not to say Brexit, Brexit will mean in practice. This makes it extremely difficult for local authorities across the country to plan for the future. It also makes it difficult for businesses and residents to plan for their futures. However, despite these uncertainties, we have been proactive in North Tyneside. We have worked with our partners in the public and private sectors through the North East Brexit Group to understand the, the potential impact. Earlier this year, the group published a report on the potential impact of Brexit. It is available on the North East Local Enterprise Partnership website for all members to read it this so wish. Then no supplementary chair. Was the first thing I was going to ask. Um, question nine to the elected mayor from Councillor Janet Thank you, thank you. I think would you like to answer that being the councillor? Oh, sure you would councillor. <laughs> Um, yes, I absolutely agree our schools. schools and teachers, and most importantly, young people should be congratulated on another successful year across all phases of the education system, from early years to its sixth form. The key measures in all phases are at least in line with expected national averages, and many are above or well above. Our A level <coughs> academic results are the best ever and continue a five year improvement and achievement. Our young people are well prepared when they leave school for the next stage in their education, training or for work, and very few do not have a desti an own destination. 
I'm particularly pleased that I'm with people who are disadvantaged and those who are looked after have achieved well and improved their outcomes. Do you have a supplementary question? We move on to the question to the elected mayor from Councillor Wallace. At Major Osbert, question 10. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my joke about the members opposite Councillor Wallace using this car park as close to their political offices more than members on this side is not really relevant now because I don't think Councillor Oshcroft visits their offices very often. <laughs> the temporary car park up at Camden Street closed on 5th September. The form is part of the delivery of our best, ambitious investment plans for Northern Square. The site is now subject to an exciting new development that will transform what is a derelict row of former office buildings into 20 year high quality new homes, bringing a much needed lift to the area. I am fully aware that managing demand for a park in our town centre is a challenge for the borough, a fact that underpinned the principles of our recently approved parking strategy introduced for a widespread consultation. The, park, the car park at Macallan Street was only intended to be available until a North London Square site was redeveloped. However, we will continue with our free parking at Norfolk Street Car Park, which has 66 spaces, and King Street Car Park, which has 39 spaces, which means there are 100 free spaces in North Shields Town Centre for residents and businesses alike. We always listen, and North Shields Chamber of Commerce been in talk with us about free parking, and we will continue to review the situation going forward. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. And now, to declare the meeting closed and wish everybody a safe journey home.